During World War II, Bletchley Park in rural Buckinghamshire was once Britain's best kept secret. In these huts, Alan Turing and his team devised electromechanical decoding of encrypted Nazi messages. Appropriately, Bletchley is now home to the National Museum of Computing. The museum came about as, a, as an idea by a group of trustees who wanted to capitalise on this wonderful location that is Bletchley Park, the birthplace of modern computing, and tell the story of computing from that first ever computer, the Colossus, through to the present day, and let people know about developments for the future as well. I'd done a lot of research on the history of early computers, and I knew how important the Colossus was, and so uh, when we came to Bletchley Park, and that gave me the excuse for rebuilding it. And this little piece of kit here uh, is an undulator. And basically all it is is a pen recorder. Yeah, this is a, an Elliott 803, to give its official title, 803B. This computer here is around about 1962 build. So this is um, uh, known as our mainframe room. And what we have in here is an ICL 2966. From the late 70s. One of the things that the schools, when they come here, like to have is um, the interaction with computers. And this is where the children can come in here and they can realise how really good old games were. The items came together from a variety of sources, different groups of volunteers working within computer conservation groups, identifying artefacts that we felt would make good uh, displays in the museum. They've been gifted to us and assigned to us over time and now we're assembling them into different displays. From the very early days of computing, even pre-computing with slide rules and calculators, right the way up to, well, machines like the one that I'm sitting next to from the 70s, uh, which is an air traffic control uh, system, right the way through to modern day machines, all about the personal computer and its transition. During World War II, the German Lorentz cipher machine created coded messages which were transmitted by radio to the Nazi war machine. These transmissions were intercepted and sent to Bletchley Park, and the world's first electronic programmable computer, Colossus, would calculate the key code, which then enabled messages to be deciphered. The intercepted Nazi radio signals were printed out initially onto paper tape by an undulator. And basically all it is is a pen recorder that traced out the uh, telegraph signals being picked up by the uh, receivers onto a narrow paper tape called slip. WAFs would interpret these messages by hand and then transfer them into punch paper tape for Colossus to make the massive calculations which produced the key for that day. Colossus used over 2,500 valves and thousands of feet of wiring and was built by a team of brilliant post office engineers. When I started to try and find out all the information about it, of course it was still top secret classified. I managed to, to find uh, uh, ten fragments of circuit diagram kept illegally by engineers, as engineers always do. I didn't tell GCHQ I'd got them at that time, uh, otherwise they would have been removed from me, but uh, I got them and that was the important thing. That machine worked so fast that it was able to break those codes in time for Churchill and the War Cabinet to know that the deception for the Normandy landings had been successful and therefore saved many lives. I felt fairly confident that we would be able to rebuild it. Tommy Flowers was a post office engineer, so he used standard post office equipment, went down to stores and got them. And so Colossus is built from standard telephone exchange equipment. And luckily for us, British Telecom was decommissioning old mechanical exchanges, lots of scrap around. So when they were decommissioning an exchange, I backed a lorry up at the back door, collected the scrap and recycled it. We started by first of all getting the bedstead working. And so this is reading the paper tape optically with a, with a lens projecting an image of the holes in the paper tape through onto photocells. And that's exactly how it was done in World War II. It's a well-stated fact that the work that was done here at Bletchley Park shortened the war by at least two years. The computer was born, and by the 1950s, the Atomic Energy Research Establishment in Harwell was using this machine. This is the Harwell Decatron computer. Uh, it's here on loan from Birmingham Collection Centre. Uh, we've got it for five years, during which time we're going to restore it to full working order. And at that point, it will be the oldest working computer in the world. 
the operators were still reading paper tape and using valves. But by the 60s, things were changing. Yeah, this is a, an Elliott 803, to give its official title, 803B. This is a basic machine, and we have a control console here, which is what the operator would have used to operate the computer. But you notice there's no keyboard, typewriter keyboard, uh, there's no monitor, uh, there's no flashing lights. Uh, what we have got is a, a loudspeaker, volume control speaker is here. The, the operator actually listened to the computer. But uh, in 1962, this machine would have cost £50,000. The computer operating speed was 2,000 characters, uh, 2,000 instructions a second. The, the machine itself, the computer itself, is transistorized, and it was quite small for, for, for a computer of that time. By the 1970s, big companies and governments were beginning to realize the full potential of using computers to run their daily business. Giant mainframe computers like this occupied vast areas of a building. And what we have in here is an ICL 2966 from the, from the late 70s. Um, and this is complete um, and, uh, and, and it's got 19 disk drives, uh, four mag tape units, uh, two line printers and processors. And this is, we're going to connect this up and get it working. And that will be probably the only working mainframe in the world. In the 1980s, the computer began to move into our homes, and the National Museum of Computing's PC gallery shows just how rapid the development of the home computer really was. This is a hands-on area for the museum, and uh, we've got many machines that you may remember from your youth, and it's basically chronicling the evolution of the home computer, really. As well as interactive displays, the PC gallery shows the timeline of technical development and how it became the backdrop to the events of the 70s up until the present day. Today, Probably the biggest influence on our lives has been the internet or the World Wide Web. Um, this is the NPL gallery that celebrates the birth of the internet, which was indeed a, a British invention. And here you can see interviews with the original designers and experience early internet connectivity. The NPL display also features a timeline tracing the British development of the web and the effect it would have on us and on world government. The museum is a great educational experience. There's a chance to interact with the displays and children learn more about how we can get the answer to virtually any question simply by using a computer connected to the web. We want to show this is not just a techie museum with things in glass boxes. This is a working environment to be able to show people how machines worked in the old days, what the, what the, uh, the programs, the procedures, the interface with people was, and show all that uh, here in, in a live format. And that's the essence of this National Museum of Computing. The National Museum of Computing in Bletchley Park creates a living history and tells the story of computer development from those early dark days in World War II to the world of home computers and the internet of today. If you'd like to support the museum or make a corporate donation, please contact us at www.tnmoc.org.